Hey, Brad, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Jonathan. Can you hear me? Wow, dude. I'm genuinely impressed. You're on the road. We're doing stereo, which we notoriously have trouble getting our setup and tech working, right? Like our audience is beyond patient. And here we are, like right out the gate, just working flawlessly. It blows my mind. That is amazing. This is obviously all due to you and your tech prowess. Even <laughs> I can figure out how to how to turn this stuff on. So thank you. I say it blows my mind, but I'm like, if it doesn't work, I'm disappointed. Like <laughs> it's expectation <laughs> what did management. You do wrong. Yeah. So this is our fifth stereo live event, Jonathan. It's pretty cool. Are we hitting a groove? Like, is this adding to, in your mind, is this adding an extra dimension to the podcast? I personally think it's a lot of fun. I know I'm trying to furiously open an email that I got today that suggested like almost exactly that actually, uh, just, it seems to be working. It's a cool new flavor. They like the live, the live questions. I know I like the live questions, Jonathan. It's kind of neat to, uh, you know, just kind of be on your toes, frankly. Right. Like you never know what we're going to get with these questions. They're a lot of fun. It's neat interacting with the audience. So, yeah, it's really, really great. We had our first person say longtime listener, first time caller, uh, you know, multiple levels of adrenaline when I heard that. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Feel free to use that frequently. If you're making this on for the second week, I'm, you can, you're more than welcome to title yourself a longtime listener, uh, whatever it takes to get more of those. And there was some sense of like, uh, the winter's over and spring is here. And, uh, you, we got a comment in the Facebook group, which I mean, frankly, uh, confirmed this fact to me and I'll give it back to you for that. So yeah, this was, uh, this was really great. So joy posted in our choose up Facebook group In our choose up <laughs> Facebook group. Just, just wanted to underline that. Okay. Yep, the actual Choose of Life Facebook group. This is embarrassing. I used to listen to a podcast every day years ago and can't remember who it was. It was two guys who had a great rapport. They discussed credit card travel hacks, et cetera. Anybody recall the name of it? Who are those? Where? Who are they? <laughs> who who could that possibly be? This I was she, like honestly. I, I the straight funniest thought it was thing. a troll, I, right? <laughs> definitely thought it was a troll. I was actually wondering, like, Oh, I feel bad. Like, have we gone that far away from credit card rewards points? And like, or are we not the same guys? Do we not have great rapport? Like I instantly went to, Oh no, it's something wrong with us. But yeah, joy, uh, joy just had a, had a moment there and forgot that she was in the choose of Facebook group, which was, was hilarious. There were so many, so many good comments on this, Jonathan. I'm going to try to find them, but yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> I am curious to actually hear her reaction when it happened, but we'll, we'll set that up with one or two comments from the group in the meantime. What, what is that show? It's just, let me ruminate on that. <laughs> yeah. She said, guys, I feel really stupid. I just remembered the podcast is literally the name of this group. Choose if I, and you all are, are joking with me, pulling my leg. I was thinking there was like the best one was like, is it like the unpackers, like the unpacker, the, the unpacking twins, something like that, you know? No, it was great. Good, good humor. And, and I think part of this is to some degree, a lot of you chose to join us, uh, as part of your commute, right? Chose to join us as part of your day, your commute twice a week. And we kind of, uh, were there for you on Mondays and Fridays. And for a vast majority of us, uh, the commute got slashed and our routines got slashed and maybe we made it into the routines. Maybe we didn't, I don't know. Life changed. No hard feelings. Totally get it. But it is a sense of, Hey, uh, life is full of opportunity. We've got this. We're on the mend. And, uh, joy, welcome back. I hope we're still fun to listen to. And to your point about <laughs> travel rewards, I'm wondering, Brad, if maybe what sparked it in some way was joy is starting to think about traveling again for the first time and say, what was that show that had all those optimization tips around travel? Yeah. And this was, uh, this was one of our pillars of five, right? Our pillars of financial independence was using credit card rewards points. I mean, this was, this was a big deal, but obviously 2020 happened, right? <laughs> Nobody could have, could have envisioned that. And it takes a backseat to you, survival. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just, just a, a, a minor <laughs> backseat. I mean, <laughs> I haven't even thought about it's sad. Like I, I was having this conversation with Laura, my wife earlier today about opening up new credit cards. I mean, we haven't opened up a new credit card in over a year. You know, I mean, think about the last year, how it, I would went by in a blink. And I mean, it's been at least that long since I've opened up a card. What's funny is uh, the reason why we were having that conversation actually is because our favorite card, the Chase Sapphire Preferred. So we're recording this on March 23rd, 2021. And 
the Chase Sapphire Preferred bonus just went up to the highest bonus offer I've ever seen on this card. It's 80,000 points. Uh, obviously, there's always a spending requirement, but it's uh, when you spend $4,000 in the first three months, and there's a, there is a $95 annual fee, but Jonathan, 80,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points, right? So, I mean, that is enough for 16 nights in a Category 1 Hyatt, which... I mean, I say in category one Hyatt's all the time. These are not dumps. These are nice Hyatt place, Hyatt house type hotels. I mean, that's, you know, even if you think it's a hundred bucks a night, right? Which it's almost, it's almost always more than that. So you're talking 1600 bucks to maybe over 2,400 if it's 150 a night, right? So, I mean, that's the simplest way to, to redeem those points, but we've long talked about just how amazing those ultimate rewards points are. So anyway, long story short, yeah, as you know, I can I can talk about ultimate rewards forever. But yeah, it was pretty cool to see that bonus go up today. And actually, the funny thing, and we'll talk about this, is I'm actually kind of on like a pseudo vacation right now. So I am furiously updating. Uh, thankfully, uh, Melissa on our team is updating Chooseify's site, but I'm trying to write an email to send out to you know our list. I mean, this is a big deal with that bonus. So it's funny to be on a, a kind of vacation and try to update that, <laughs> update the website. You know, it, it, it doesn't end obviously. Right. Well, for sure. And, and I guess where, you know, where we're, we're, I'm kind of going with that even generally is, uh, you know, you're thinking about travel, travel rewards are coming back and the offers are pretty appealing because there's not a lot of people traveling right now. And what we thought we could do not today, but just to prime it, if you are also thinking about travel rewards, why don't you start thinking about what trip you want to take and you're joining us, just join us next week and bring the trip that you want to take with you. And Brad, I mean, his start was actually coaching people on how to put together these trips. He did live coaching calls. Let's do a group coaching call on how to put together your ideal trips. So you're listening to this. I can almost tell you most of the plans that you might want to take, they're going to probably start maximum flexibility. We'll start with one of the cards that Brad just mentioned. And for more information on that, you just go to chooseify.com slash CSP. But if you're trying to figure out, all right, well, okay, I understand that this is a great card or I understand that these points are valuable, but I'm trying to figure out how to steer them, how they might be part of my actual redemption plan. Join us next week. And we're going to dedicate that to helping you figure these trips out. So I hope you'll take us up on that and um, let's start, you know, filling up some plane seats again. We're not going to do that tonight though, because I know you didn't have enough time to prepare or to think about that. So what we thought we would do tonight is we are going to go back to basically how to do college for less or whether or not you even need to do college at all. We're just kind of going to parse it with the framework that we have now, some uh, 400 odd episodes and almost invariably three episodes a month that would in some capacity touch on, you know, optimization tactics around college. What are the best practices now in 2021? Has anything changed? What should you be thinking about? So that's going to be our focus. Those questions will get really high priority. So if you have any questions related to college hacking, college tips, uh, ROI based stuff, definitely send it in. And we want to include that. And we'll also just kind of continue a conversation around that, uh, from our end as well. So Brad, any other final thoughts you want to add onto that before we kick off this, uh, the show? Yeah, I would just say that that does sound like a lot of fun for the travel rewards. I haven't done the, uh, travel rewards coaching. I mean, Jonathan, I literally, when I started at richmondsavers.com, like eight years ago, I would quite literally at my lunch hour have 30 minute one-on-one calls with people. And I mean, I would help, I mean, at that point it was hundreds of people, right? It wasn't thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands. It was just literally one by one adding up the people to help. It was, it was very, very hands-on, but it was, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, that would be really neat to get back to. So I guess we'll do that next week. That'll be uh, the 30th when we record that. But yeah, for, for today, anybody who's listening to this live on the stereo app, if you want to send in a voicemail, uh, we can definitely play them. So I think last week we had some issues. Hold down the button while you're recording. I think that's that's the absolute key here. We had a couple of people get their voicemails cut off. So be sure to hold down that button. And yeah, like Jonathan said, send them in about alternatives to college, different types of jobs you can do that might be some type of hack or way around spending four years and potentially a quarter million dollars on on a college degree. So uh, this is not and has never been the anti-college show. I mean, I think what this show is, is seeing a problem, 
and seeing the world differently, right? I think for so long, so many of us have just slept walk because society tells us there's a path to success, no matter what that path is. And I think what we do is, in the Phi community, we take a step back and we look at the world as it truly is. And I think that's something, Jonathan, you especially have hit on in the last couple of years is you would have done maybe, I mean, it, it's a little, uh, a little excessive to say your life differently, but you certainly would have done a good portion of your education over the last 15 years dramatically differently if you knew then what you know now. Yes. Yes. And we, and, and I would just give myself a little bit, a little bit of credit. I was during a massive transitional period on the ROI of college and the cost of college and the information and the options were not as readily available as they are today from my perspective. So I'm trying to give myself a little grace with why I didn't crush it as much as I would have. I would love to be able to tell you that I did. Um, I did not. I, I, I finished my doctorate, finished my, got my pharmacy degree, and I came out with $168,000 of student loan debt. So I thought, so tonight we're going to take a look at the ROI of college and how to improve that ROI or crush that ROI. Um, and then, you know, parallel to that, maybe, is it even necessary? What are the things to consider? So I, I would like to start with just kind of this framework. Like if you were to go back to the, if you were to go back like one generation, it was very common for someone my age or your age to be able to say that we are the first person in our family to maybe ever go to college. That was, that was a, you know, that was, it was something like, if you want to make it into the middle class, if you want to guarantee the best outcome for yourself, you need to go to college. The, the college is acting as a gatekeeper to jobs that are paying an above median income. And so if you want to just laws of probability here, you want to be on the other side of that, you need to go to college. And that was a truism. And, and to some degree it, it still is, but what has shifted and the reason it's so important to have this, cause it's kind of been stealthy and sneaky is the cost of college from the time that, you know, someone that's maybe 10 years older than either of us was going to college to now, you know, our age, the cost of college doubled, tripled, probably 10 X from when our parents went to college. It's insane. And the earning potential did not, the earning potential did not rise at the same rate. It did rise. It did not rise at the same rate. And so you could have a scenario where someone could cash flow the cost of college, you know, for our parents and maybe to some very degree, there were still a few people that could do it. But now the idea of cash flowing college, if you're just trying to brute force it is unrealistic and unreasonable. And so we just, we cannot afford, uh, you could almost afford to our parents' generation, Brad, I'll give this back to you before we get into some real numbers. We could, your parents could almost afford not to look at the ROI of college and just say college. You could throw a dart at a wall and it was going to pay off for you. That is not the case now. I have friends that have $90,000 in student loan debt and are working three jobs to make 55K. You know, that's just, that's, that's, that's a reality. And so to ever talk about college without, without mentioning or looking at ROI is just, it's, it's a, it's a false and expensive narrative that will cost you a lot of your life. So Brad, that would be just kind of the framework that I want to use for this. It's without the luxury of just not having to worry about ROI. We have to be looking at college through the lens of ROI in my mind. Yeah, I agree. I think that that to me has become glaringly obvious over the last, certainly the last five years and probably more than that, is that this is a dramatic decision and there are options, right? Like if there was only one option, then okay, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck, but there are clearly options. There are options of whether to go to college or not. And then there are clearly different options amongst colleges, right? So I think, I think what we need to understand is what are we trying to get out of this, right? Like you use the phrase gatekeeper. And I think for a lot of us and a lot of society, a college degree is actually just signaling. It's signaling that you're following the rules or that you could check the boxes to get a degree. But does anybody actually think that by definition and this and let me just take a step back i am very pro education so let this be as clear as can possibly be i think education and educating yourself over your entire lifetime is critical i mean i i, I know i said this last week if it were up to me i would read five hours a day i think it's just the best way to learn to see the world and to understand deeply so I am about as pro education as a human being can possibly be. I am not pro closing your eyes and just following what society says, because that's what's always been done. So I think going back to what I was saying, does anybody 
actually think that if somebody walks up to you with a an undergraduate degree, that it means they have mastery over something or that they are by definition better than everybody else who doesn't have a degree for whatever job it may be. And I think, you know, certainly as an employer or somebody who who is a manager, like I I don't see that. I don't see that at all. I think it's somebody who, again, they got 120 credits, they dotted I's and crossed T's, but do I think they're ready for a job at 22 with that degree just by definition? No, because I, I don't know that it proves anything, right? Like, I don't know what what that degree says. I think it says very, very little, again, by definition, Jonathan. So, you know, as contrasted with particular skills, and I think that's something that you and I, over the course of hundreds of episodes and many, many guests who have come on and talked about what skills can I learn? that that's actually the distinction that I would make. And frankly, like this is, this is an awakening that I've come to as an adult because I went to college. I thought it mattered where you went to school and I thought it mattered what the prestige of the school. So like, I am a convert. I mean, this is not like I've thought this long. I, you know, I am a true convert in this. And I think what matters now, what I've seen is that skills matter. And I would be, yeah, I, I could probably argue that to the ends of the earth that what matters is actually skill. All right. So let's talk about like the variable, like if we're going to create our own kind of Venn diagram and we won't formalize this tonight, but like, you know, when we're doing an episode on college hacking and, and optimizing the cost of college, you know, there are different considerations. And so, um, are you going there? So let me just, I think first and foremost, no one can afford to go to college without looking at it through the lens of ROI. It's almost like table stakes. You just cannot, no one can afford to go to college and pay hundred plus thousand dollars and then come out and make 40 or 50. You're just setting yourself up for financial chaos for a decade plus, maybe multiple decades of your life. It's just a bad strategy. So we, we all need to keep that in mind. Now, once we understand that and we agree on that, and I recognize that maybe not everybody does, if you have a reason that you want to put in the voicemail on why you shouldn't met care about how much, you know, the fact that it's a two to one ratio of what you spent to what you're going to make on the other side and how much time it took you. If you want to debate that, that yeah, this is great. Let's put a voicemail on. But if we all agree that you're right, that's probably going to be rough. Working down some of the others, I, I can appreciate that there would be things like, all right, well, they need to have the college experience. College experience is part of adulting. Or as part of our Venn diagram, let's keep moving it on down here. Gatekeepers. If you want access to upper middle class jobs or an upper, you know, an upper, you know, better income above median income, we need to get past the gatekeeper or th- or another one like true love of learning. And they have a skill set that only this college can give you and maybe not even love of learning, but you need a skill in order to get the skill. You have to go through this Avenue. Um, Brad, does that, th- those are, those are not, you don't just pick one. It's a combination likely of those three, but is there anything else obvious that you would want to add on to that? I feel like most people's incentives to go to a college is probably wrapped up in some combination of those three. Yeah, no, I mean, that that about covers it. I think uh, a phrase you brought up in there was opportunity cost, I, I think. And, you know, we should definitely should definitely talk about that sometime in, in this conversation as well. All right, cool. So what's interesting is uh, the, let me just be brutally honest as I go through these three kind of subcategories and give you my perspective. And then we'll compare and contrast that with you. And we'll talk about how, that kind of had an influence on what we actually pick. So you can actually now start to do this. And then we'll start talking about general strategies with what I know now, what would, what would I actually want to do? So for me, I did not really care that much about the actual college experience, even at that point, but I had decided I wanted to go into pharmacy. And so college was going to be the gatekeeper that would, you know, had to go to this four-year institution in order to then get into pharmacy school. So since the college experience was not particularly important to me, the prestige of the college was not particularly important to me. Uh, I did two years at a community college and then I did two years at Virginia tech. So I graduated my bachelor's degree at Virginia tech. And then I went and I transferred that into pharmacy school here in Richmond. And I got my pharmacy degree there. Now, the reason I point that out, the college experience was relatively low on my list of our priorities. And so for, so I could see some individual, they might write off what I just did because, well, you're not getting the full experience. I'm fine with that, but you might not be. And so like, we can talk to Brad now a little bit more about his path and we can just do a little pros and cons there. And then we'll kind of talk about optimizing these and what it could save you and how to kind of work through that. So Brad, you know, as you think through the same list, 
what was your goals by going to college? Yeah, that is uh, that's a good question. It's hard to put myself back in my 17 year old shoes. It's been a while, unfortunately. But my goals in going to college were to ultimately, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess in theory, it was to get a job. But I don't think I ever thought about it as concretely as that. I think in the back of my mind, that would have been the answer is when I graduate from here, I will be able to get a job that I would not have been able to get at 18. So I think that if you asked me back then, that probably would have been the answer. Yeah, my college search was an interesting one because like I said before, I think partially the like prestige of schools mattered to me, but luckily it didn't really matter that much, which is, a, I know, a weird kind of mix there. I've said before, you know, kind of weird to say this, but like I was accepted to Ivy League schools and, and places like that. And I wound up, not going to those schools because at that point they were, it, it was too expensive and I didn't want to spend that much money. So I, I did have a FI kind of mindset, even at 18. And, you know, my parents had saved some money for me, you know, we're not like super wealthy people. So it wasn't like, Hey, college is free. It certainly would have impacted how much student loan debt I would have come out of college with. So, uh, this was not like a, Oh, poor me scenario. I wound up going to the university of Richmond, which is still like a top I don't know, 60 or, or thereabouts school in the country. Uh, so, you know, wonderful school, fell in love with the place. It, you know, that college experience, Jonathan, was important to me. And it was, you know, again, you're a 17-year-old kid making major life decisions and, you know, feeling at home at a place actually mattered to me. So that that impacted me for sure. But yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I guess somehow there was a good fortune slash some, uh, I, I don't know, financial wherewithal of saying like, all right, I can't go to a school that costs at that point, it, it sounds quaint now, but you know, a place like Cornell or Duke, where it's like $32,000 a year, which again, sounds quaint in today's time. But you know, then that was extraordinarily expensive to me. So I just did not want to spend that money. So yeah, again, the long story short, all of those factors were on my mind when I made that decision. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I point that out is the actual college experience mattered more to you than it did to me. You know, I, I, just the way it was framed out, it was going to be, I mean, Richmond's a great school. Uh, U of R is a fantastic school. And, uh, you know, they also have a fantastic experience. And so I just want to be mindful, like we're going to try to give you kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a runway here, an a la carte option to just pick, you know, based on what you want. We're not trying to steer you to one as much as just say, and if this is it, if the college experience is the thing, then let's start here. So let's start assuming the college experience, the actual school uh, is very important. We're going to probably, and you have time, right? So if you are, you, know, you have, you have time, you have some planning. We're going to start probably the most obvious way. We're going to talk about, you know, your SAT scores and your ACT scores. And without like trying to unpack all of this and go into a super deep level, we put together two episodes, which will be worth their weight in gold for you. If you are getting a little bit farther ahead and maybe there's a third, but Brad, I went ahead and pulled up with Brian Eufinger who's been on the show a couple times. I pulled up uh, episode 114 and episode uh, 154. Were those the ones that you were thinking of as well? Yeah, indeed. And Brian has a tutoring company called Edison prep. So it's edisonprep.com. But yeah, those are the two that, that I remember Brian being on. So, Brian basically is saying like in these two episodes and, and I'll please, I'm encouraging you go to chooseify.com slash one, one, four, go to chooseify.com slash one, five, four, like listen to these episodes if this is you. But Brian is saying like, if you, if you give yourself time, if you're not starting late and he walks you through exactly when, so maybe you have a freshman, maybe you have a sophomore, maybe you have a junior. He talks about it for each of these years. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to target. Here's how you can actually focus on this. And if you do this, this will be fo them focusing on their SAT scores, you know, focusing on this, basically this algorithm will be worth way more than a summer job for them. You know, just getting this right and going through this process. Episode 154, I believe was a slightly different take. And it was actually looking at optimizing or hacking the FAFSA. So, um, we'll come back to that in just a minute here, but, you know, actually knowing what, you know, when you're applying for financial aid, so that is a, what a needs-based, a needs-based scholarship or needs-based help. What from the parents' tax returns and the child's tax returns, if they're earning income, what actually factors towards that calculation? And just those two things alone, knowing 
what comprises the FAFSA and knowing how to go into the SAT with a game plan can unlock massive discounts on the estimated cost of college. Yeah, those episodes were real eye openers for me. I mean, it's uh, again, it's the five mindset, right? It's thinking long term. And I think that if you could sum up what is the five mindset, it's long term thinking, it's some planning, it's foresight, it's knowing the rules of the game, right? And Jonathan, to me, those episodes with Brian, that just personified it. It was, it was exactly that. It's all right, instead of when your kid is 17 and a half, start to think about, oh, what am I gonna do for college? How am I gonna save? How am I gonna cut down potentially on the, you know, or increase the aid ultimately that we're gonna get? Start thinking about it when they're 10. Start thinking about it when they're 12, right? Understand the rules of the game. So I think that was that was critical to me. There's a couple of tips on there. Uh, let me play this. Let's see, we'll get it teed up later, but there's a couple of tips on there. One of the biggest things that I thought that was interesting on the FAFSA is knowing the list of schools that promise to meet full need. So there's some schools that offer full need. Like if you qualify, they will cover everything. In fact, we can come back to U of R. I think U of R, there's a pretty interesting caveat on what U of R covers versus schools that will do what's called gapping, where they, they meet the difference between what your expected family contribution is and what the, 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 uh, and what the actual tuition is, something like that. So you have your amount you have to pay and then they just cover the difference. So knowing the list of schools that promise to meet full need, you know, be very careful, uh, what, you know, blankets you're using sports blankets you're using when you have your kids wrapped up them and they're like, no, I have to go to Virginia tech. I have to go to UVA. You have to go to that school right across the state lines. Be very careful if they've already decided from, you know, right out the gate, they're just going to go to this one school. If we can say, Hey, here's a great list of options, pick which one you like the best. And we'll target that. You're giving yourself a lot more freedom. So, uh, just a quick tip there, Brad, I thought we could pivot just slightly. We can spend a little more time here if people want this article, by the way, hacking the FAFSA uh, at choosefi.com, which again, you can access by going to choosefi.com slash 154 contains the tips that I just shared with you, plus like six more that you probably have not even considered. But the, the place I wanted to pivot next is actually the, the scholarship game. So we have two different types of scholarships. We have needs-based scholarship, which yes, you're going to want to know how to game the FAFSA, what goes into the FAFSA. But then there's the other half, which has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with what showed up on your tax return last year. And it's a merit-based scholarship. And so Brad, we have, there were some amazing tips that were rolled out on the show over the last couple of years around that. And I'll give it back to you just to set up and then we can dive into it a little bit more. Yeah. So for me, the one that, that jumps out is certainly... Uh, Cody Berman on episode 83, he talked about about these type of of merit scholarships. And it 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 again, it really goes beyond just the individual tips into a thought process. And I love how he approached this. And I guess so, Jonathan, there's there's two main parts of of maybe potentially merit scholarships or community scholarships might be another way to look at this. But on the community scholarship side, what Cody did was, he looked at applying for scholarships almost like a part-time job. Instead of getting a job flipping burgers for a minimum wage, he looked at it and said, okay, what can I do to apply for all of these scholarships, large and small, right? And in many cases, the smaller ones are gonna give you a much higher likelihood of, of winning, right? Like if you apply for whatever it is, the, the biggest, the Coca-Cola scholarship that gives you, you know, a hundred grand, I'm just making this up, but it, it's, it's something not, not far from that. There are going to be millions of people applying for that. But if you find smaller scholarships that might give 500 or a thousand or 2000, the likelihood of you winning is dramatically higher. And I think what he did was he looked at this in terms of systems thinking. And I thought that was what was so beautiful about it was that he broke down the scholarships and the, the essays and the different types of applications into different groupings and basically said, okay, there's something on the order of four to seven different types of questions that I'm asked. So what if instead of writing a brand new essay for every single one, what if I wrote the best four to seven essays that I possibly, possibly could and spent tons of time on them and then just, so then he has that as, as that system. And then he could just adapt. This is obviously not just copying and pasting, but adapting. But you have 70 to 90% of it already written. I just, I thought that was really, really brilliant, Jonathan. 
Yeah, there's not an unlimited number of ways that they ask these scholarship questions. When you actually look at what's behind it, there's, like you said, there's six or seven that have different words that they're using to get to the same point. Tell us something about you that makes you a remarkable candidate for this scholarship, you know, or nine variants of that. Cody, I mean, to be honest, this is a skill that all of us need. Like what you're doing is you're testing, you're iterating and you're, you could get, you know, if you end up building a system, whereas instead of you having to start from scratch every single time, you got to, this is the same part of like, Cody is a business owner. Now he's applying the exact same skill set with his business and his content creation. Now you, you write your first draft and you make it as good as you possibly can. You submit it to a bunch. They don't accept you. And you're like, how could I make this better? And you keep iterating it. You keep iterating it. And it's just, a, you know, the, not getting the scholarship. If you're only applying for one scholarship, then that no is decimating. If you're building a system in place and you're using the no as feedback, okay, what else can we do to improve this? We've already gotten our answer. Now you keep iterating it until you get to yes. And this is how people end up locking down million. I mean, there's people out there that have gotten millions of dollars of scholarships when all of us are freaking out because they build systems around this exact process. I would just kind of scale that to business owners now. Like I think about what Jonathan, you just said, Cody's doing it with his business. Now, what does that mean? So like, if you have a website, if you have a blog, you write a first article and you're trying to rank for that article on Google, maybe, you know, like I want to get this article ranked for Google and you write it and nobody, Google doesn't give it any love. It doesn't show up anywhere. You then look at that. You could just say, oh, I should just give up. Or you could say, I wonder what would make this a little bit more attractive to Google. I wonder what would make this more attractive to readers. People will, why are people, because Google is an algorithm is looking to see whether people are, you know, enjoying your content. That's part of it. And so you could then spend time there. And so Cody's taking the exact same system and process that he learned as a student. And it's now a life skill. And how can I build systems and constantly improve that 1% better on the content that I'm creating now. So I just wanted to point out in terms of your talent stack, having your child think, go through this process of writing copy, selling themselves to the people that are extending the scholarships, and then taking that no and realizing you can say no 50 times. I only need to say yes once, you know, that's valuable. And that will actually carry with them and probably give them as many life lessons, if not more than a summer job especially if you two together collectively pull it off successfully and they're able to bring down some serious scholarship money. We had, uh, there was one more couple, Brad, and I, I need to go look up her name right now. Uh, they were from Utah and he created a website, $2 Eats. Do you remember? And she basically, that was her story. She did something very similar as well. So if you can dig that up, uh, we'll, we'll highlight that in just a second here because that episode contained it. And I know she actually does. I think she was even considering, I don't know if she ended up doing it, but doing a little bit of coaching around this as well. So maybe maybe something there. Why don't we go ahead and bring in a couple of voicemails and see what the, you know, what ideas are coming in from the community now. I see a bunch of you have actually added your voicemails to the queue. So this is fantastic. Let's go ahead and kick this off. And uh, Brad, I play it whenever you're ready. All right, let's rock and roll. Hey guys, it's Rob here from Chooseify Foundation and The Simple Startup. I have a couple of college hacks for you. The first one comes from my parents who moved back to Ireland, um, where they're originally from, so that I could go to college there and my siblings as well, because it is pennies on the dollar to go to college in Ireland versus in the US. So maybe look at some geo-arbitrage options for getting the cost of college down. The second one is for grad school, I did a grad assistantship where I coached women's soccer at a private school and I was paid a stipend to do it and I got college for free. So I got my master's for free with a stipend. So I came out net positive from grad school, which was an amazing thing and really helped me get a, you know, a decent job afterwards. Thanks guys. All right. So we're talking about, so let's extend this out. One is, is there a way that I can actually add value to the university to get discounted or free tuition? And so at the graduate level, Rob crushed it with that was able to get his master's using that. Brad, that would actually scale to undergrad if people were to look into the RA program. And I think we talked to Anthony Gary, uh, who was really highlighting how he had gone to college for profit, leveraging that exact program. Yeah. Wow. That's a good memory, Jonathan. Yeah. That's certainly a way to, yeah, I think you can get a significant amount of money depending on the college. I think that's what Anthony said is every college has something different for many. It's your entire room and board, which can be a huge amount of money. Uh, it could be, I mean, I, I think at some colleges, it's even partial tuition. So yeah, it can be pretty significant. 
All right, that's episode 138, How to Get Paid to Go to College with Anthony Gary. Chooseify.com slash 138. Consider this a springboard to get you to the exact content that matches up to where you are in the Venn diagram that we talked about earlier. Okay, as we mer- move down this list, let's mention just one more thing there on the scholarships. Niche scholarships are another one. There's a few just to be aware of. One of them is the Caddy Scholarship. That's one that we talked about with Noah and Becky. Brad, I know that was always one that just totally baffled you that that was out there and that people were doing that. It was common knowledge inside that niche. Or rather, that was the point, is that it was only people inside this these small circles that knew about this. Why doesn't everybody know that this is a thing? That one was amazing. Yeah, I remember Noah and Becky, I guess, they, where did they go? Purdue, I think it was. Purdue. So, I mean, it was a top, yeah, top tier college as golf caddies, a golf caddy scholarship. That was remarkable. And there are so many of these. I think that to me, Jonathan, was when I really started thinking about this, like this crowdsourcing concept of like, how do we put all this stuff together and just get a repository of it where we can all, as a FI community, put these little random pieces of information together, right? Like if you can do that, then we've got something. And, you know, we still still have yet to to fully realize that. But I think maybe this episode can help galvanize that. I right? mean, this episode's a repository. We're just showing you yeah. we haven't lost or forgotten these. They haven't been lost to time. We're, we're circling the wagons here. We're saying, look at all this amazing stuff that's been uncovered and just go use it. You'll save a bunch, a bunch of money. Uh, so niche scholarships, that was one, uh, Brad, I think, let's see, we could talk about, we'll talk about, uh, military scholarships. That's another one. Yeah. I think we've got two voicemails coming up on, on real good ones here. So let's, uh, let's see what we've got. Do you have any advice on how to incentivize your kids to apply for scholarships and choose an affordable college? Thank you. I would happily like either work with them or pay them or whatever funds they were able to get, like you know, double that in some capacity, like one-to-one. I mean, there's the, I would gamify the heck out of this. And Brad, I hope uh, you and Laura are going to do something with the, with your daughters. Cause I know that was something like Laura, as soon as she heard about this kind of, you know, building this, this, this system out, I know that was something that really sparked her interest with Anna. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is something that, yeah, to your point there, you can gamify this for sure. You can also, this is something that we've been thinking about a lot in our household. And and I'm glad we got this question because I I realized I left this out before when I was talking about kind of my own, my own search is my one great regret is simply that, you know, especially knowing what I know now and learning from Brian Eufinger and, and people like that is there are lots of merit scholarships. And if you, if you don't care, if you will, about like the absolute most prestigious school, that there are a lot of schools where I get, you know, someone like me, hopefully someone like my daughter, many, many people can get significant merit scholarships. And I think you need to, again, look at this, Jonathan, it goes back to that ROI calculation, right? If, if you make the determination that college is crucially important and that you're going to spend four years of your life there, do you really want to spend 20, 40, $60,000 a year out of pocket or would you like to do it for free or close to free, right? And if you make that determination that, hey, I don't want to spend a quarter of a million dollars for this name brand, but man, I, I could probably get a merit scholarship at these other thousand colleges in America. All of a sudden, it's time to start thinking about that. It's time to not be a snob about this kind of stuff. And I'm talking directly to myself here, right? Say, As you can the tell. only one of us on this call that ever, like, yeah. ever questioned that. But I'm not. <laughs> I appreciate what you were doing and the spirit with which you were saying it. So I'm letting it slide. <laughs> no, clearly aimed directly at me there. And, you know, I think I think what we've done with our kids, and not that my parents were ever snobs. It certainly wasn't coming from them. If anything, it was from the environment of my high school and friends and things like that. But we have made it very, very clear from the first that we don't worry about prestige when it comes to college. We specifically, we never talk about that kind of stuff. We talk about making the best decisions for ourselves. You know, like, unfortunately, this has been introduced even into my daughter, Anna. She, for middle school, they have selective middle schools in our county. And she got into the, you know, two most selective schools. And we decided not you know, as a family, we decided not to send her there. You know, there's a high likelihood she's going to get into the most selective high school a year from now. And I think there's a high likelihood we're not going to send her because that's not a priority for us. 
you know, and I think, I think talking about this rationally as, as a family and making a decision based on what works for you. And I think we've already started laying the groundwork for, wouldn't it be amazing to get a, a full scholarship to college, you know, and wouldn't it be amazing to go to that honors program at that state school, as opposed to worrying about, am I going to get into Harvard or Princeton or MIT? You know, like that was the stuff that stupidly I cared about. And I, I, I want to like go back and punch myself, honestly, Jonathan, it's ridiculous. But like, I, I think it's, it's starting to have those conversations about what, what this means for your family and what it means for your life. When you personally, the student, when you are saddled with debt, right? I mean, Jonathan, to your point, you were saying a decade or more decades, right? You can be saddled with student loan debt for decades. So this is not just a decision to make on a whim. It's something you need to consider because every subsequent decision you make in life is going to be colored by this one decision for college. And that's why it's so critical. And yet we're having 17 year olds make life decisions that can impact them negatively for decades without any kind of real thought or counsel. And I think that to me seems criminal, right? Yeah. And no one's slowing them down, but also slowing them down without providing them a better option, a better path, any like guidance. Like it's just, it's, just, it seems like people, like there's a lot of people that would say, they would tell you, oh, well, you don't want to, you know, student loan debt, that's good. But then they don't give you a better choice. That's not really helpful for you when you're trying to figure out what to do, just tell me what not to do. Like instead, give me a couple pathways and let me kind of do my own calculations. But it's nice to have someone just slow you down a little bit and let you say, okay, here are, here are the choices and here are just a few considerations. And I think everybody just needs to be very cognizant of like this number. And I pulled this, this was data that was pulled. I believe it was 2020. The average cost of college, if it wasn't 2020, it was 2019. The average cost of college was 110 to $120,000. That was the average cost. Now, maybe some of that was covered by scholarships or savings or something else, but the average cost of college, 110 to $120,000. The average income for that first year grad from college was $50,000 a year. Listen, that is financial suicide. You know, it is just, it, it, it is, it is, you can come back from it. And your income is not your income. Like you can make more, obviously you could make more the second year and the third year and the fourth year, but assuming those numbers are stagnant and you're getting your 3% raises year over year, you're setting yourself up for a very hard road to crawl out of. We can solve that. It's fine. Lots of us have had to deal with that. But what if you didn't, if you're in the place now where you're making the decision to go, please consider the Venn diagram that we're talking about and look for a way not to nuke your plans or not do it but just do it with a little bit of optimization. Like if we can save you, it's so much easier just not to take it out and make a few switches, a few optimizations here than it is to pay it back. Paying it back is very boring and it's very long, tedious process, especially when your debt to income ratio is two to one. And it's worse than that for some people. Um, I, I wanted to just say one more thing here on the, hey, go lean in and do hard with the SATs. SAT prep, it, maybe something to consider in getting paid SAT prep. If your plan is I'm going to crush the SATs, uh, then that might be the, the way to do it. And I would have told you that back in 1999, I would have thought it's probably just like buying a, you know, some sort of Kaplan book or something like that and trying to go through it. And, and I'm sure I've bought many of those like monster paperweight type books that they just end up being paperweights that you throw out when they're eight years old. And you're like, well, I don't know, maybe my child will use it. No, they won't. No, they won't. Uh, what I would just say is, if you're looking at actually crushing the SATs and that's your strategy, I would highly recommend that you look for someone to help you with that process and be willing to pay a fee for that. I mean, it's just something to consider, but if that's the process you want to go to, take a look at it. Brian, uh, Brian uh, Ufinger, and he works at Edison Prep, really convinced me of his value. And I, I can't account for every test prep person out there, but Brian Ufinger is a hidden treasure. Now, here's the problem with me telling you to go check out Brian Ufinger. He says, my business is the least scalable business in the world. Yeah. Oh, well, he's actually, Jonathan, he's pivoted. Oh, really? Yeah. With uh, obviously 2020, he has had, and, and I'm going to his website right now, but I know he pivoted to online courses. So Does keep talking, that? but let me, let me confirm that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe you can access. I was going to say this will only, this recommendation will only work for you if you're in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so if you're in Atlanta, Georgia, 
go to edisonprep.com and just check him out and see if that's it's something to do. But if Brad, you're telling me if he's scaling out, then maybe, maybe he, he maybe it was limiting belief and he figured it out. Yeah. I mean, he certainly had, he had online courses in 2020. I suspect that he's still, yeah, virtual. I'm, I'm on his website now. He has virtual classes. That's amazing. All right. Edisonprep.com. So SATs don't do the Kaplan book. I mean, maybe do the Kaplan book, but what I think his big advice was do not do a big box center, you know, test prep company on this. And that sounds very self-serving, but here, here was the thing. Here's the case that he's making. You're getting basically some intern, you know, being paid, you know, 13, $15 an hour. That's just, you know, going through the chapters with you. It's minimal additional value. Whereas the approach that they take is very holistic, looking at your actual goals. And he looks at it through a very fine lens. So when you, I think by the time that you listen to episode 114 and 154, you'll know why I would take the time just to mention him specifically. Yeah. And I think the, the point there is again, it's knowing the rules of the game, right? And, and, I, and for me, all of this is about a thought process. It's about seeing how the world works and, and just figuring it out and moving towards that. So, right. I mean, we, when Brian talked on those episodes about just how critical these are, in fact, many of these colleges have very specific cutoffs when it comes to if you get X SAT or ACT score and Y GPA and you are above both of those thresholds, you get 75% merit aid you or you get 85%, whatever it is. I think I forget the exact college, Jonathan. I feel like it was like the University of Alabama or some such, but I know Brian has a list of this. We can try to put that in the show notes. I suspect it's actually in the show notes of one of those episodes, but there are very specific and just obvious thresholds. So if you know the rule of the game is that if you get a certain SAT score, okay, well, this is, this is not some test that's unknowable. You can study for that. Like you said, instead of getting minimum wage for flipping burgers, this might save you tens upon tens of thousands of dollars just by knowing this, this test. That to me seems like a slam dunk. So yeah, I thought that was, that was incredibly cool. And yeah, Jonathan, should we load up another, uh, we got another voicemail here. I know you mentioned the military. I think that's something that's, that's an interesting order. Do you have uh, further thoughts on that? Let's hear the voicemail and then we'll react to it. All right, cool. Hey guys, my name's Chase. I just wanted to talk to you real quick about the ROI of college in the military, uh, specifically the national guard. So here in Florida, we have uh, an extra program on top of the normal federal benefits for, uh, tuition assistance that actually allow me to pay the school out of pocket, uh, educational dollars for duty, then reimburses the school who reimburses me. And thanks to my civilian career, I'm able to, uh, once I pass the class, submit the transcript and all the costs of books, everything like that. And luckily I'm with, with an employer that will pay up to 5,200 bucks a year. So the last couple of years, I'm 25 now, I've actually made close to, depending on how many classes I take, close to 1100 1200 bucks each semester. So just something for people to think about, especially joining the military. There are additional benefits on top of federal. Yeah, this is, uh, I think really understanding the full benefits that come with a military career is worth a podcast episode. If you're considering a military track, you got to look at the whole package. Your actual base rate is just the tiniest little piece of, of what is, what is, what is coming with that and what is coming with your compensation package. And, um, you know, what, what Ed and Doug Norman have said to us in the past. And, and I think it's really important is like, when you make the choice to serve our country, what is amazing is if it's unpacked, if you're actually shown, you have all the tools you need to do your time, to put in that time of service, and on the other side, never have to work again. Everyone goes to the end of their, and then this is, there's examples on enlisted and there's examples in officer. It's not just, oh, we'll go become an officer. It, it's both sides. But you need to know how your compensation is put together and how to best optimize it. We had a military dollar on, it was episode 95 of our podcast, and we asked her to really break down all of these points so that individuals can really start thinking through what is their full benefits? And the great thing, this episode was recorded a while back, but it was done on the other side of uh, how, you know, they changed the, 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 they changed the approach for actually retirement in the military. And they allow people to kind of do a hybrid uh, where they did not in the past. A lot of people had to make this inflection point 
Uh, whereas it used to be all or nothing. Now you can kind of have the best of both worlds. And so uh, this episode 95 walked you through just how to understand what your military compensation package includes and went into the details around really optimizing for college and for the GI Bill as well. Just wanted to point that out to people. Yeah, I think, like you said, we're going to have to get an uh, actual expert on here to talk about all the specific benefits. But I know just off the top of my head, there's ROTC and there are the military service academies. So, I mean, there are a lot of options when it comes to saving money on college with the military. Now, clearly, it goes without saying this is not a decision to make lightly. You, uh, after graduation, have to put in X number of years, you know, in many cases, I think it's five is the number I've heard uh, of active duty. So again, not a decision to just make on a whim, but I know, so, I mean, we know clearly about the the service academies and, you know, how m many of them work, but ROTC is, I know that was available at, at my college. I know at Virginia Tech, your college, they there were multiple, multiple ROTC programs. So that's something that I think as I understand it from a friend who went through it, I think once they were fully accepted into the program, they wound up getting, I think it was sophomore through senior year paid for by ROTC. Again, don't quote me on this. We'll have to get a real expert on this, but that's, that's my strong recollection is that uh, by signing up, they wound up getting college, which would have been pretty significantly expensive for free. Uh, at least the years that they were in. And, and again, they had to put in active duty time afterwards as if they went to West Point or Annapolis or, you know, the Air Force Academy. So, uh, you know, those are options that are available for many, many thousands of people all across the country at, at universities far and wide. All right, Brad, what's up next? All right. We got another, uh, another voicemail. I think we have a, uh, a, maybe a third time caller here, Jonathan, Ooh. actually. Hi, Brett and Jonathan. This is Marjorie calling with a quick college hack. I would probably call it college arbitrage, mm. but um, pretty much I just wanted to point out that um, you could always, in order to increase your RRI, look at other countries to go um, take your degree. Uh, for example, I'm originally from Puerto Rico and I got an engineering degree for about $3,000 a year, uh, which obviously does not compare at all to the astronomical price that uh, people have to pay here in the U.S. Um, we had like an Abbott accredited um, university, so I was able to get a job hired directly from Puerto Rico into the U.S., no problem. Um, and we're also like an American territory, so that helps. Um, so um, always considering other options. So, where you go to um, do your studies would be good. Um, it would give you like a good experience um, to go to another country and get immersed in something else. So just wanted to point that out, that that's an option as well. Listen, my reason, Marjorie, that's amazing. But my reason to not do travel abroad was it was going to be more expensive. That's always the thing. Well, well it's going to be more expensive to take more time. You could, you could like, this is massive. You could just using this. I mean, you could travel abroad. You're in Puerto Rico. And you're doing it for literally 3,000 versus probably 78 to 100,000. I mean, that's that. This, these are real numbers. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that is amazing. The funny thing, Jonathan, I think what you're thinking about is exactly what I'm thinking about, which is study abroad, right? So you're at your college or university and you are studying abroad and you're paying the same rate and then probably additional amounts. So it was, it was highway robbery, basically. Yeah. <gasps> But this is not that at all. Marjorie is describing, and Marjorie, thank you again for the voicemail. And I appreciate getting your emails. She uh, responds to my five-weekly emails every week, so thank you. Um, and it's very similar to what Rob was talking about with that geo arbitrage options overseas. There are many just wonderful, wonderful universities in the world where we're clearly very U.S. centric, right? Like that we live in the U.S., we think about U.S. universities, but there are so many incredible opportunities outside of the U.S. for a fraction of the price. And, you know, you get true life experience. I mean, Jonathan, you kind of mockingly or, you know, kind of in, in, in all the wow, best ways. Wow, way to really about... shade my comment. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I mean this in a good way. All right. You mockingly say about the college experience, right? The BS, uh, yeah, you know, okay, yeah. college experience here in the U.S., which is basically, you know, what we all know what that is. It's drinking yourself like crazy on Friday and Saturday in many cases. Like, that's the college experience. Whereas going to a university in a different country and living on your own and getting by, like that to me is actual life experience. Like that's something I can make a case for if 
my kid said, hey, I want to live and go to university in Spain or in Puerto Rico or in Ireland, right? Like there are so many options. It's a great big world out there. And if you can do that and get true life experience and do it for a tenth of the price, I mean, goodness, that's remarkable. I mean, this is going to come as probably a shock to some parents, but I'm just going to have to ground you real quick here. So uh, back in 2011, 2012, when I was going to school, we were very excited when the lectures were recorded. And we would often, unless we were not incentivized, not go. Right? Okay, <laughs> fine. I'm just putting it out there. That was that was me. I'm pretty sure that's a universal truth uh, for a lot. I'm sure some people love being in the front row of the classroom. I'm sure plenty of others, if they know they can just get the lectures, like, well, it's recorded. I can stop it. I can take my notes better. I'll do it at home and I don't have to get up and go to class at 7 a.m. Parents, you're paying for glorified Zoom classes. Sorry. It's just yeah. Well, and this year they're not glorified. Yeah, they that, are that, was that was pre-COVID. That was pre-COVID. Now <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> That's so great. I, I think uh, talking about arbitrage, or, or that might be slightly imprecise, but uh, talking about interesting ways to, again, look at the rules of the game, which the rules of the game are in American society, getting that degree from a four-year university is the key. Not going to that university for four years. And there's a big distinction there, right, Jonathan? And, and actually, you personally surprised us two years into the podcast and said, oh, by the way, this is what I did. People not and do that. So no. again, the distinction, right, is the degree from a four-year university versus spending four years at that university at full price. Yeah, I, I Brad did, had just realized or found out it was a thing here in Virginia. I don't know if it's because he's a uh, Long Island import or because, you know, generally people don't know. I mean, genuinely, I, that's not, I, I'm not sure which of those it is. I. I would have to talk to another person in Virginia and see if it's, but this is available pretty widespread around, around the country. So I'm going to assume it was just a blind spot for him that the guaranteed acceptance programs in many States are basically say that if you get in Virginia's case, I'll speak, it's, I'll be specific in Virginia's case. If you go to a community college a state community college for two years and get your two year degree, you are guaranteed acceptance into a four year school. I don't actually know what my SAT scores were. I did it one time. I didn't worry about it. I nailed my three, five. I was guaranteed acceptance to the four year school. So you're immediately, immediately saving well over 50% of tuition. Uh, even when you're in state, I'm sure if you're talking about in state versus out of state, it's many multiples, it's multiples of that, but you're immediately saving over 50% there. And then, yeah, to your point, you're guaranteed admission. So I could have gone to UVA. I could have gone to, uh, I did go to Virginia tech, could have gone JMU, George Mason. We have a ton of schools to pick from here in the state. And then from there, when you graduate with your four-year degree, your bachelor's degree just says from Virginia Tech. It doesn't have an asterisk. It says community college. It just says Virginia Tech. Uh, and I was able to go to pharmacy school with that. All your transcripts are brought in, and, and it just it totally works. It's absolutely a, a no-brainer to be able to you know save a very, very significant sum of money in individuals that they should look at them. They should have. Now, I will say, you know, caveat this. I noticed at the time my plan was always go to a four-year school and I was, I was not as intentional as, okay, let me give you the full spiel here. It's, it's important because it would have saved me some time. It would have saved me some money. If you take that approach, you have got to be serious. Community college, uh, I don't know if it just has a not serious aspect about it, or you have a lot of students that say they're going to go to college and maybe work a second job, but it's just not a priority from them. That's not, you know, it's, it's some sort of self-selecting nature of the kids that go through the gauntlet of getting into a four-year school, end up at a four-year school, and the kids that take the easier path, potentially of going to a community college, sometimes just don't take it as seriously and they tend to drop out. I don't think that that has to be true. I just recognize that it bears up, not with the non-traditional students, people going back, they crush it. But the 17 and the 18 year olds that are getting in there, a lot of them, and I had some friends end up taking a two-year degree and stretching it out over five. It's not the point, right? It's a very mercenary play. We're getting in and we're getting out. And this is where I messed up. I was just trying to get a degree I realized by the time that I graduated and I was now guaranteed acceptance and I was going to Virginia Tech, you go into the Bert, into the admissions office, to the guidance counselor office, and you're trying to figure out what credits will transfer. And suddenly you realize that they don't all transfer. Only the ones that are on the map of what Virginia Tech offers. So you're a little underwater basket weaving that you took there as this fun one-off because it was fun. Oh, wow. Community college offers this. Well, your plan wasn't just to go to community college and get a two-year degree. It was to go to Virginia Tech. So if your plan is to get into a four-year school, 
you need to almost first go to the four-year school and look at the courses that they accept from Virginia Tech and then just take those and then figure out what else you need to get it to a, a bachelor's or sorry, to get it to, to, to get your associate's degree. And there might be one or two extra, but because I did not take the approach that I just laid out to you, I probably end up taking five to 10, somewhere in that range classes that I did not need to take. Maybe I'd have to go back and think, but it was probably, you know, probably a solid 13 to 18 credits did not transfer. And if I'd known this, it's a big tip. It really is. Yeah, that's a great tip. And I think that's actually when I learned about this. So yeah, it's the guaranteed admissions program. And then in Virginia, and like you said, there are, I, I suspect many states in the US that that have something similar, but I, it looks like every single Virginia university has slightly different requirements. So they have slightly different GPA requirements, slightly different course requirements. So you need to, as again, as an 18 year old kid making this decision, you need to really dot the I's and cross the T's. You need to be certain that you are locked in. I mean, that's a real life skill to be able to do that because they do not, from all the research that I've done, this is not made easy for you. And Jonathan, to your point, if you miss a class or two, it's not going to happen that you have to take an extra semester and that's half of a year of your life potentially. Right. So like there are ramifications for not following through to, as, as I said, dotting I's and crossing T's. Now that said, like, man, what a cool way to get two years of college for nearly free. And in the case, at least of uh, the state of Virginia, you can get into, you can, you can have your cake and eat it too, right? So it goes back to, hey, I, sure, I may not care all that much about the prestige, but if they're going to give it to me for free, well, I'll I didn't say free. Right? I, we'd, so, have to, we'd have to cross check free. A community college is not free. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah, just, I mean, it's, it's probably 25 to 50, you know, 25%, maybe as much as 30, 40% of what you would pay at a four heavily. No, no, no. And, and that's not what I, 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 I meant in a, a joking way of, Hey, if I can get into the university of Virginia, which is an extraordinarily difficult college to get into out of high school. Yeah. But if I can go to a community college okay. and again, pay for two years yep. of community college, yep. I was being facetious there. Gotcha. That was, that was a, a, a I just poor remember choice. I was cash flowing that I was, you know, my parents, uh -huh. love it. I, I was like, oh, my son, those hours can, I was, I was not free. First of all, I no, it definitely it. is not free. Yeah. 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 <laughs> a, a, an inartful use of words by me. So I apologize, but, but right. So if you can go to one of these community colleges for, for really pennies, you know, a couple thousand dollars over, over two years and then get guaranteed admissions to UVA or William Mary or any of the other top, top tier, Virginia Tech, James Madison, all these top tier universities, you don't have to get the good SAT score. You don't have to have the perfect high school record. You are guaranteed admissions, right? So you get a degree from a world-class university and you only paid for two years of it, plus that little bit you paid at the, the community college. So, I mean, to me, something like that is just, that was a blind spot for me. As you said, you rightfully said, like, I simply, I don't think, at least to my knowledge, that anything like that existed in New York at the time. But, you know, I, I may be wrong about that. But, yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised to uh, learn about that here in, in Virginia. All right. So let's talk about a couple other strategies that are somewhat related to this. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to quickly breeze through both of them here. Uh, but they're super valuable. So one is how basically the idea is how can we just like test out of college? And there's two different approaches that you can take to this one. Uh, actually, uh, in our, in our company, Ed, uh, his, him and his kids have actually leveraged this. It's dual enrollment. So when you, when you are, when you're, when your kid is in high school, uh, AP classes, uh, can potentially transfer to college. You get college credit for AP classes, depending on the grade you get, but your other option is to legitimately just go take a college class and get high school credit, right? And that is called dual enrollment. And Ed, you'd, Ed used that uh, with his son, Zach and Xander, both of them in Washington State. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to remember which actual university it was, and I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, so, but it was in the state of Washington. Uh, and they were able to get college credit for their high school classes. By right? going to take these college classes, it, it worked both ways. So that is one way that you could effectively eliminate the need. The other one that I'm going to spend, a, a, Ed tells me it's a UW. All right. For those of you that want to clarify that, it's UW. Now, uh, the other one that I'm going to spend a little bit longer on here is actually CLEP testing. This one blew my mind a long time ago. It continues to blow my mind today. I mean, when Brad talked about what I did and kind of being, it's kind of hard to get to your homework. This is really hard because they don't want you to know about this. 
colleges do not want you to know about club testing. I'm just, it's up front. They make it very hard to find this information, but when you find it, you can quite literally test out a college. And we had, did an episode uh, with Millionaire Educator. It's episode 238 uh, most recently where we just had him break down the strategy because he got another degree during the first 60 days of COVID. From scratch, he got another four-year degree in 60 days. I think something absurd like that. Just a test to prove a point that it's actually possible. You could not lock down your bachelor's degree. And I think for him, it was totally free, but he said even now you could do it for like a couple hundred dollars, probably totally. You could have a bachelor's degree in 120 days. Now it's gimmicky. You got to completely let go of your desire for the college experience for this. It's so off the rails, but if your goal is to get a bachelor's degree and do it inexpensively and you feel like that's holding you back and you want to do this, like check the box and look into clep testing. Holy crap. Episode 238, chooseify.com slash 238. He breaks it down step-by-step step and shows you what he would do if he were doing it today. Yeah, and he gave some amazing resources in that episode. I think he talked about modernstates.org for clep testing. And there was another, you talked about that that extra degree he got just at the beginning of, of COVID in, in 2020 at Sophia.org. And I think some of the details on, I think it was free at the time, uh, but it's still, it's still a pittance. So uh, definitely something to look into just again for, for options, right, Jonathan, that's what this is all about. And I think we've got a, uh, we've got another real speaking of options. We've got another really good voicemail here. So I'm going to, I'm going to cue this up. Hey, I just wanted to leave a comment about this program called Scholarship for Service. You can visit sfs.opm.gov for additional details. But um, there's a few different universities that participate in this, and they basically pay for your entire schooling. Uh, you get a $25,000 a year stipend. And um, once you're done with school, you do have to work for a government uh, agency for I believe about four years or so, but regardless, the, there's some major benefits. And then, um, you know, also you, if you if you do want to stay stateside, this is a great option to not have to use uh, geo arbitrage for reduced price in school. I believe he just said they pay for college and you get the stipend. And the worst part of this yeah. is on the other side, you have a guaranteed job. <laughs> that is is amazing. Yeah, it was a little little hard to hear the voicemail, but yeah, scholarship for service. I think he said sfs.opm.gov. And actually, Jonathan, this reminds me, I don't know how I remember this. So this is usually your thing, but Sonny Burns. Do you remember way back in episode 139, he talked about this with, uh, so I looked up our show notes real quick at chooseify.com slash 139 and the De Department of Defense Smart Scholarship. Yep. He talked about exactly this. It was uh, when you were awarded the scholarship, it's it includes full tuition and a stipend of twenty five thousand dollars a year. This is the exact same thing that that our voicemail caller was talking about. I, I would almost be willing to bet that's yeah, that is amazing. So maybe that is actually the the URL that Sonny meant to tell us way back in episode one thirty nine. So sfs.opm.gov. It'll be linked up in the show notes for this episode as well. And let me just mention for those of you that are finding us on stereo for the first time, uh, this is the choose if I podcast that we're bringing to stereo to make it more interactive, uh, for the next several weeks. And you can find us at choose .com, Or if you listen to podcasts, go to your podcast player of choice and just search for choose if I one word or two that's choose financial independence, choose F I. All right. I wanted to kind of wrap this with an idea about, do you even need to go to college? I mean, I think it has to be the last part of the Venn diagram to really scoop everybody. You can see how we've kind of worked through this. I think we, if we say our umbrella banner was like, what's your ROI, everything that we've talked about will improve your ROI. And then we said, okay, well, what's your priority college experience? Are you trying to get through the gatekeepers? Are you trying to preserve? It's a for a love of learning. Like what's your real motivation to go. And now at the end of all of that, like, Let's just say it's like love of learning. No one's getting rid of love of learning, but I do not care about the college experience. And I reject the idea that colleges are still the gatekeeper. I don't think they are anymore. And so I used to think this and be irritated about it, but I couldn't definitively prove it outside of an anecdote. And now I feel like, Brad, I can say definitively in a replicable way, you do not need to go to college to make $60,000, $80,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year. And you don't need to go to school for, you know, for four years 
at a hundred thousand dollars to come out and be making fifty thousand dollars that first year. Like I, I feel like I can say we have definitively proved that out. If you want to make six figures and beyond, like multiple six figures, there's a path for you without college. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree, and I think we've had guests just like how this was a look back on a lot of our thoughts and our evolution and a lot of the guests we've had on. I think we've had a ton of guests come on and talk about different options for for getting jobs in various fields, right? I, I personally would love to do a second episode in this. I, I kind of actually thought that was where we were going to go this episode, but we had so much just on college itself that, I don't know, I mean, are you up for doing that on on a second episode? I think that could be pretty amazing. Well, yeah, I, I totally think we can, uh, let's see, what time is it right now? I think we should just air it, like do a little bit of it right now, because I know this is what his son did, but we can go far. I would like to do a whole other episode on, and we'll have to, build out our resources so we can do more. I'd like to give one example of a non-college path that would give you the results that I just laid out, because I know this is something Ed is actually looking into with his youngest son, Xander, and I believe he submitted a voicemail. So pull that up when you're ready. All right, let's do it. And one thing we can do is to look at this a little bit differently, and that is uh, coming at it from the angle of not college. Um, that's probably the ultimate savings, <laughs> not going to college in the first place. And where I'm coming from is uh, my son, my 18-year-old son. He's about done with his associate's degree, courtesy of the state of Washington. Uh, we've got dual enrollment here. And so not only does the state pay for his two years, uh, his, his um, what's equivalent to his uh, freshman and sophomore year, it's also saving him two years. And so he's going to take a year, a gap year, to pursue the uh, Salesforce uh, career development program that we've got running at um, Talent Stackers. And um, just as I've, we've seen so many testimonials of people having great success, even without college or without a uh, tech background, getting into a tech adjacent field and earning $60,000 uh, right off the bat within six months. So it's a free roll. A free roll, right. There's really no way to lose with something like this. So just be aware, and I agree, we'll, we'll carve out and do a whole episode. And just be aware, these, uh, these non-degreed certificate-based programs that are skill-based, you get a skill that's in high demand, which, which Salesforce is in crazy, crazy high demand right now, especially if you know how to brand and present yourself. Uh, it's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, if you just lean in for just a few months, you could have better results than someone that spent four years and a hundred thousand dollars, you know, on college, uh, you could have better results financially than, than they did. So if individuals are interested in just checking more information, we will not spend any more time on this episode, but just go check it out. You can go to, uh, choosefi.com slash Salesforce. We actually walk you through why this is probably the, one of the best, you know, I don't know, best opportunities that's out there for individuals who are looking for an alternate path to college right now. Um, Okay, Brad, I think we got yeah. uh, we got a full episode here. Yeah, this was great. And and yeah, I'm really excited about that part too, right? You We've talked about Salesforce numerous times and how people are getting legitimate, legitimately high paying jobs right out of, out of programs like that. And we've talked about, at least on my newsletter, we talked about Google has now started a certificate program that they're giving cover to hundreds of other major employers to say, hey, we can look outside the box of what we've done for the last 100 years, which is you have to have a four-year degree, right? We just, we look at these as like potentially game-changing thing. We, again, we talk about skills, right? We've talked about coding boot camps and that careers, high-paying careers that require coding skills, they don't care where you went to college. They care, can you do the job? Very simply, right? And can you prove it to me? And I think that's what a lot of these certificate programs are doing. They're saying, can you do the job? And I think that's just such a wonderful rethink. And it really, it opens up the world to what kind of skills can I accumulate, right? We've talked from the very beginning at Chooseify about that talent stack, right? What are the various skills that I can have in my background that make me different from anybody else, right? I don't need to be world-class at any single one of those things. But if I have five skills together that I'm really, really good at, that there's very simply nobody else in the world that has those five skills, well, I am different and I am, I am employable, right? Think about that. You don't need the fancy degree. You don't need the opportunity costs of spending four years, 
you can get a job in a couple of months and then have those skills and then learn more on the job. Keep learning. It's about lifelong learning. This goes back to what I said an hour ago is we are as pro education and learning and skills as anyone around, but we are anti just going with the flow with your eyes closed because that's what society says. I don't think anyone in the Phi community just closes their eyes and goes with what society says. We choose to ask questions. And I think that is an empowering and just marvelous thing. And uh, yeah, and Brad, you know, if someone does that personal inventory and just comes up blank, says, oh, I don't have any skills. That is, you know, that's, that's great that you sparked that and you had that realization. We can then start. And so now the question is, well, what is the best way to acquire the skills I want? or the, acquire the skills I need to get the job that I want. That's a much better frame than focusing what's the degree I need to get the job. Like, that's the right. Now, it may be that after you do that assessment, what skills do I need? You end up landing on the degrees critical, right? I just want to point this out. There's an interplay here, but I think we have seeded uh, this logical thought flow around what skills do I need? And for the last decade or two, we've just said, what degree do I need? It's flawed. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to be very inefficient. Just focus on the skills. And if the, that, that question leads you to school, to school, to education, to college specifically. Now, okay, now we're, we're on the right track here and we got to go through the Venn diagram, think about ROI. But I, I hope that was helpful. I hope that, you know, to your point, Brad, I hope this did spark questions. And maybe there's something in this episode that you want to review or, you know, you're using this as a springboard, like we're encouraging, like go deeper there. We don't need to spend an hour on CLEP because not everybody's interested in that. But if that, that was like, oh, wow, how do I do that? Go deeper there. So- let me encourage you, go to Chooseify, just like, I know, we threw a lot of links at you, and hopefully you grabbed the ones that you needed, but if you missed all of them, and you're like, do I need to go back and listen to it, just go to Chooseify.com slash college, like, this was our promise, we're putting all of the content there for you, make it very easy for you to find all the resources that you need, that's Chooseify.com slash college. I hope you found this episode valuable, share it with friends and family, I think it can save you decades of your life. It can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't think that's hyperbole. I think if we were looking at aggregate people that take action on these, there's millions of dollars of savings here for the community when you take action on these ideas, only if you take action. And with that, the fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.